Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Alex and Brian coming to you again this week on Mondays. We wear red. It's a new rule. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, episode two of the Grassy No. Brian out here pumping out content, making everybody else look uh, like lightweights. But we're able to track down uh, probably the smartest person that we know. And we're lucky to say that he knows us and was able to, to, to hop on. Pretty important person in Brian's life. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll let him elaborate on that. But they sat down to talk about the uh, mound builders of eastern Kentucky, southern Ohio region. And uh, that is the extent of my knowledge. Brian, enlighten them. Yeah, so Dr. Tom Majasic came on, and he's got a Ph.D. in American history. So he knows a little bit about this stuff. Um, he came on and talked about the mound builders, specifically like the Adena culture, the Hope Wells. Later on, we had the Fort Ancient people as well as the, the Mississippians. Yeah, they came in a little, not much, not much longer after that, actually. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, so he came on and had a discussion about that. We'll definitely have him back. He said that there was some, you know, some stuff left untold which is pretty cool That's yeah good. yeah Love a teaser yeah yeah you gotta keep, keep keep you guys coming back for more um but yeah tom um thanks for coming on we talk about some pretty cool stuff okay yeah so we're going to talk about serpent mound and the mound builders and stuff like that absolutely um, is there anything that you want him to pull up um before we you know, kind of get started, started? Yeah. Like that you're going to start with? Yeah, there is. The first thing I'd like them to pull up, there, there are a series of conical mounds in Ashland, Ohio, that should be on that Facebook page. They're, they're just kind of boring looking uh, rounded mounds. Go to the where all the pictures are, and we should be able to find them very quickly. Right? Ah, oh, you just passed it. There, there, that line. Oh. See Daniel Boone? Oh, I bet it's right here. It's right where to the right of Daniel Boone. Oh, uh, right here. Yeah, right there. That's a real good starting place. And then now it's on the far left. Just bring up the picture itself. There you go. Right there. That's what we want. Okay. Okay. So we'll start here, and um, you can kind of explain to us what these are. Absolutely. Uh, these are Adena burial mounds. And uh, there's a park in downtown Ashland called Central Park, and uh, the library is there, and you would – say, park in the parking lot of the library, and you would see several of these Adena conical burial mounds. Uh, Ashland was literally ringed with them. But Hmm. there are only about five or six of them left, and, uh, you know, they've been preserved. And these these are classic Adena burial mounds. Now, the the Adena are the first group of mound builders uh, in the Ohio River Valley. And uh, the Adena had a very, very uh, wide cultural area. And I'm not sure if you can see me here, but I have a little map here on the side. And it kind of shows the broad area, this whole area where you see kind of that large circle with lines. That was all the area of uh, of the Adena culture. And then we'll talk about another culture that was kind of embedded in the middle of that Adena culture. So who were the Adena? Well, about 3,000 years ago, for some reason, the, the, the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley, in southern Ohio and northern Kentucky, southeastern Indiana, basically a, a, an area that would start around Louisville and go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then several hundred miles north and south of the Ohio River uh, from, from that spot, those spots. 
these Native Americans somehow developed a very, very strong spiritual sense. And they began to pay a lot of attention to to funeral rites. Are so there when any... someone would die, uh, they started burying them in several specific manners. And we're not really, I should say, scholars are not really certain why they buried different people different ways. In some cases, they would create uh, a tomb, if you will, an mm -hmm. underground tomb, and they would line it with bark, or sometimes they would line it with logs, and they would stretch out the body there. Sometimes they would cremate the individual. Uh, sometimes they would wait until birds pick the flesh off, and then they would smear a red ochre, like a, a, a red clay, and, and put a few items in, burial items in, uh, cover it over, and, and then build a mound over that individual. And uh, oftentimes then someone else who would die, they would then bury them in or near the same spot, and they would cover that with a mound. And, and over time, these large conical burial mounds hmm. uh, would appear. Now, what, what's kind of unusual about this is Even though they have these fairly sophisticated burial rites, the Adena had what we refer to as a mixed archaic uh, economy. So they relied very heavily on hunting and gathering, but they weren't just nomads. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> they would live in small lineage groups, maybe uh, four or five families together that were related and, and they would have specific areas each season that they would move to. So let's say a certain type of berry uh, would become ripe in a certain area. They would move to that area for several months. Um, as the weather changed, maybe they were gathering acorns and maybe there was a grove of, of oak trees. So they would, they would migrate to that area. So they don't have, they don't have permanent villages but they do have structures that they come back to in a kind of a seasonal pattern over time. And uh, they don't have really large towns or anything of that nature, but they do have these mounds uh, and they do have fairly sophisticated burial rites. Well, why would you have a burial rite? Well, that implies that, <clears throat> you know, you, you believe in an afterlife. Mm-hmm. So the Adena are over a very wide area. We know they have contact with other people. Uh, certainly, we'll find certain things like, like flint and some of these burial mounds. Um, and we'll, we'll find some pottery and things of that nature. It's not overly sophisticated. And it, it was really kind of odd. For a long time, it was believed that they didn't, they didn't have agriculture. They did. It's mm. that archaeologists were simply looking for the wrong plants. So, at some point, and you know, in that 1100-year history when the Adena culture thrived, at some point they began to weed out some plants so that other plants could thrive, and uh, in particular, they cultivated. Uh, what is called sump weed. They yeah. cultivated may grass. They cultivated sunflowers. Uh, any grasses that had kind of a seedy head, you know, sometimes you'll see weeds come up and, and you see those seeds at the top. And yeah. what they would do is they would, they would take those seeds and uh, with a mano or with a pestle, they would grind them into a paste. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then they would eat that paste. So it, it supplemented the nuts and berries they were gathering. Usually the women were gathering. Uh, also, they, uh, the men were doing hunting, primarily small game like deer and rabbit, uh, squirrel, things of that nature. So they did actually have a pretty good diet. And it, it was varied, you know, it was varied between vegetables, fruits, and meats, just what a dietitian would tell you today. Yeah. And, uh, but but like I say, they don't. They never develop large cities. They never develop large towns. 
They have fairly sophisticated burial rites. Sometime around 200 BC, there is one group of Adena who just seem to blossom. Yeah. And uh, their culture alters itself so radically that we see them as a different culture, though they're the same people. And it's not like this happened instantly. You know, it's not like it happened overnight. There was kind of a gradual change. And I, I'm not sure if Nick can bring this up, but I have a, a actual replica of it here. There's a, a really interesting pipe that is known in history as the Adena pipe. And it's embedded in those uh, Facebook pictures. There you go. You've got the Adena pipe there. And I'm, I'm holding it in my hand in case you can't see it well from the other. This is, this is a pipe that occurs very, very late in the, in the uh, life of the Adena culture. And what's fascinating about this, it was definitely found in an Adena mound but it has some cultural features that you would tend to identify with the Hopewell culture. So mm -hmm. if you notice the, the spools here, uh, generally like you identify gauges. that with the Hopewell culture. And also, um, if you'll pardon the expression, he's kind of wearing a loincloth. And mm -hmm. the loincloth has a design, probably a design of a bird perhaps a scavenger, uh, another motif that we tend to identify with the Hopewell culture. Uh, it's generally believed that this pipe is of a dwarf, and it's believed because he, that because he has very, very short legs, he yeah, has elongated dwarf, arms, uh, he has a goiter around the throat, which was very, very common before we iodize salt. And... Uh, for hmm. some reason, both the Adena and the Hopewell people, it's believed, tended to identify uh, dwarfs with spiritual power and spiritual qualities. So very, very often uh, they would serve as shamans. So it is believed that, that this effigy pipe is probably depicting a, a eight Adena shaman. And... Hmm. Uh, you would put your tobacco here at the top of the pipe, and uh, if you'll pardon the kind of grotesque expression, coming out of his hind end is is a stem that you would you would connect with uh, a wooden part of the pipe. So you would kind of be smoking it from something <laughs> that's uh, coming out of the rear of, uh, of this yeah. particular dwarf. So the tobacco's <laughs> up here. The stem of the pipe would be connecting here near the bottom. And yeah. uh, you know you're taking your drag of tobacco, and they did, they did kind of cultivate a wild tobacco, mm. probably for ceremonial purposes, as yeah. Native Americans certainly did in the historic period. But this really nice transitional piece, uh, you can actually see the original at the Ohio Historical Society Center uh, in Columbus, Ohio. You know, it's on full view. Like I say, this is uh, uh, kind of a replica of it. Yeah. So you kind of transition from the Adena to the Hopewell, but the Adena don't really disappear right away. So you have about a three to 400 year period when these two cultures are existing in very close proximity to one another. And, uh, and the Hopewell are kind of surrounded by uh, people of the, of the Adena culture. So if I can go back to my map, for just a minute, and you can let me know if you can if you can see this map. Uh, there, if you see the the area here outlined for the Adena culture, there are yeah. some dark areas right here in the center, primarily and along the Scioto River Valley in southern Ohio, uh, the Great and Little Miami River Valleys in southern Ohio, and then a couple other spots over here around Newark, Ohio, and uh, over towards... Uh, southern indiana and that's the area where the ohio hopewell lived 
And what they do is they take this, uh, how should I put it? They take this mortuary science to the next level. So they are continuing to build conical burial mounds, but then they also begin to be build huge earthworks around these walls, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are three principal centers. It appears there are three principal centers uh, in southern Ohio in which the in which the Hopewell lived. One ceremonial center is clearly at Newark, Ohio. And uh, there you'll see three really impressive mound groups. Uh, Octagon Mound is one, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then at another part of Newark, there's what's called the Wright Earthworks. And then there's what is called the Great Circle. And all three of these earthworks are connected by a lane. So they built a walled lane that, that runs in a straight line from the octagon mound to the right earthworks, from the right earthworks to the great circle. And then what's more impressive, I wish I had a good map to show this, Bradley Lepper, who is the reigning expert on the uh, mound builders of the Ohio River Valley, uh, believes that there was a straight road, a lane, if you will, that ran from these ceremonial centers in Newark in a southwesterly direction to ceremony, Hopewell ceremonial centers in Chillicothe, Ohio. Hmm. And I think in Chillicothe, Ohio, you actually, there have been identified five large separate uh, ceremonial center, ceremonial earthworks, and uh, they are now protected by the National Park Service. And one group is called the Mound City, the Mound City Group. That's where the headquarters is for the uh, National Park Service there in that park. Uh, there's also the Hopewell Group, which I believe is, is, is very, very impressive, though most of the mounds there have been destroyed. Some of the walls are still there. Uh, the Hopeton Group, uh, and there are two others in the area. Uh, one is called High Banks, and High Banks is very, very similar to uh, the earthworks at Newark. And then Bradley Leopard believes that that great Hopewell Road ran due south along the I'm sorry along the Scioto River from Chillicothe, Ohio, to Portsmouth, and there at Portsmouth, Ohio, uh, there was another great ceremonial center. So uh, the fact that these were connected by these uh, straight roads mm. That's really is cool. incredible. And the remnants of these roads or some of the walls along these roads can still be seen today. Bradley Leopard believes that these roads were used for pilgrimage. That so very sense. close to Newark, Ohio, uh, is what is called Flint Ridge. And Flint was really very, very important uh, to the Hopewell people. They used Flint uh, to create arrowheads, to create tools, uh, to create uh, ornaments, gorgets, if you will, things of that nature. And uh, near Portsmouth, Ohio, is the center where the Hopewell mined what's called pipestone. And one of the things that the Hopewell did was they they manufactured these beautiful effigy pipes in huge amounts. So I'm holding a reproduction of one of those effigy pipes here. It is Move of a raven or, or a scavenger. Uh, again, you would put your tobacco in here, and in the front uh, is a hole where you would smoke it and, and of course, pass it on. Uh, here's another. And, and these are, oops, sorry, these are built to scale. This is of a, a wolf, a wolf pipe. And you can see some of the other pipes demonstrated here. So <clears throat> if you have that road running, uh, basically if, if you go north from Portsmouth on the road, you're bringing up pipe stone. If you're coming in a southwesterly direction from Newark, you're bringing flint. And they kind of come together at Chillicothe. Hmm. which undoubtedly was a, a center for manufacturing, not only did these 
items have a utilitarian value, but apparently they had some religious significance also. And the Hopewell were very much involved in a vast trade network that encompassed all of the interior of North America, from the Appalachian Mountains to the Rocky Mountains, from Lake Superior in the north to the Gulf Stream in the south. That's so insane. what we can find in their graves, we can find grizzly bear teeth from the Rocky Mountains. We can find sheets of mica formed into mm. claws, uh, formed into hands, formed into other effigies. We can find uh, copper that was mined at uh, Isle Royal in Lake Superior. We can find seashells that can only be found in the Gulf of Mexico. And every year, mm. groups of Hopewell would, would go in large dugout canoes, so large they could hold as many as 20 men. They would be loaded with these ceremonial pipes. They would be loaded with, with tools and arrowheads and weapons made out of flint. And they would be rendezvousing with Native Americans from different cultures at specific trade centers, specific trade rendezvous where they would exchange these products and they would bring them back. And, uh, you know, they would find their way into these uh, fantastic uh, ceremonial centers, which did contain grave sites, but they also contained mounds uh, that did not have any graves in them. So they were being used for other things, exactly what, certainly a mystery. We also know that the, the Hopewell uh, did more agriculture uh, than their Adena neighbors and that they were very attuned to the movements of the moon. So if you could find that uh, slide of the octagon mound, Go certainly the one of the most Facebook, fascinating yeah. uh, earthworks anywhere there it is oh that yeah yeah so you can see the you can see the moon there that's the picture i want right there if you stand on the end of this circle and i can see your little arrow is very close to that your little hand was very close to that. if you stand right there um if you would move your circle i'm sorry if you'd move your hand uh through the circle through the lane and then off to the left, to the left corner, no, the far left corner of the octagon mound. No, move it up. Yeah, there, right there. These two corners of the octagon mound, on the far left there and on the far right, trace the rise of the moon, the full moon, every month in an 18.6 year cycle. Mm -hmm. And it is more accurate in following that cycle of the moon than Stonehenge is in following the rise of the sun during the summer solstice. So uh, it is almost uh, perfectly built to track the movements of the moon. So certainly the Hopewell were using this to mark time. Mm. But their obsession with the moon would also imply other things. Exactly what those things are, we really don't know. And we really don't know simply because uh, they did not have a system of writing that, that we understand. So, mm -hmm. Have we found actual writing and it, it's just non-decipherable no. or no. just nothing? No. Yeah. The only thing we've ever found are uh, what are called pictographs hmm. and pictoglyphs. Um, someday I'll, you know, if you want to bring your camera, I'll take you to see one. Uh, it's not that far from Eastern Kentucky. The Leo uh, pictoglyphs are uh, near Jackson, Ohio. You're yeah. showing some of those from the West. So pictoglyphs and pictographs. Yeah, there you go. Uh, those are the Leo pictoglyphs. Uh, oh, yeah. I went to see them. Very, very hard to find. They're kind of on a flat rock and pretty bizarre looking. Very hard to date because, you know, they usually use carbon dating in the prehistoric period and you can't carbon date a rock. It doesn't have any yeah. carbon in it. 
So uh, they have certainly added a little paint there so that you can actually see what the glyphs look like. But um, uh, pretty interesting stuff, but we don't really know the meaning of it. And hmm. uh, like I say, we don't really know the dates in which those uh, petroglyphs were were created in southern Ohio and, and in several other locations. But uh, but pretty interesting. Uh, so really quick, yes. when, when you first started, you said that um, – this tribe, they, they, you know, started following the moon. Is there any, do we have any ideas as to what made them choose to follow the moon as opposed to, like you said, with Stonehenge is more the sun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I have to tell you, um, it's kind of interesting how this discovery occurred. I mean, uh, Octagon Mound has been known of since the 1840s when Squire and Davis surveyed it and wrote about it in their book, uh, Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. But uh, no one really realized the significance of Octagon Moon. They just thought it was kind of a cool, I'm sorry, Octagon Mound. They just thought it was kind of a cool earthworks. Well, in 1982, there was a philosophy professor at Earlham College in Indiana and he was friends with uh, an astronomy professor there. And they got into an argument. Mm. And the astronomy professor did not believe that Stonehenge actually was kind of a, a, a huge standing calendar, if you will. Uh, that, and, and he said to his friend, I will bet you. I mean, they actually had a bet of money. I will bet you yeah. that I, you know. Pick, pick a mound, pick something, and, and I'll show you that it'll line up. I can make it line up with points of the sun, you know, because it's just serendipitous. Yeah. So his friend picked Octagon Mound. So the astronomer and the philosopher went out to Octagon Mound 1982, and try as he might, the astronomer could find absolutely no points at any significant time at Octagon Mound that corresponded with the sunrise, the sunset during the equinox, during the solstice, yeah. anything else. And and just perchance, he said, well, I'll try it with the moon. And everything lined up perfectly. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely flabbergasted. So uh, that discovery, you know, <clears throat> I mean, 82 probably seems to you to be a long time ago, but that's actually fairly recent when you consider yeah. the amount of time that that Euro Americans have been kind of trying to understand these mounds, and some of the earthworks at Newark are identical to some of the earthworks at Chillicothe. Uh, hmm. Particularly, there's one at Chillicothe called High Banks, which uh, is not open to the public at this time. But it it's it's lined up very much like some of the earthworks at Newark, and it's believed that on the Kentucky side of the Ohio River, opposite Portsmouth, uh, on a bluff above, uh, there was also a series of mounds there that corresponded with the mounds at Chillicothe and the and the mounds at Newark. So, you know, this wasn't just by chance. Uh, if you're lining these things up the same way in the same direction, then you're doing it for a purpose. And that mm. purpose seems to be related to following the moon, following the phases of the moon uh, on a set pattern over 18.6 years. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's worked out perfectly. So That's uh, insane. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. But, you know, without writing and because... yeah. And we have no time, idea. We're looking at 1,500 years. Nobody really knows why. But but different hmm. cultures will will gravitate towards one of those two heavenly bodies, the sun or the moon. And uh, yeah. it, you know, I can't really I can't really tell you why. I can say this. You know, if we compare it to <clears throat> European culture, or if we compare it to Western civilization in general, including the Middle East those cultures tend to identify the moon with uh, with things feminine, yeah. with women playing a large role in their culture. Cultures in the Middle East, cultures in Europe, 
that tend to identify with the sun or the movements of the sun tend to, you know, you tend to have a more of a patriarchy, yeah. more masculine culture or masculine dominated culture. Whether or not that holds true with regard to these prehistoric Native Americans, it's really very, very hard to say. Yeah, but it's a distinct no... possibility. Yeah. It, and, it, and it could be that women are playing a greater role within Hopewell culture because they're becoming more effective with agriculture. Mm. And in, in civilizations across the world, the beginnings of agriculture are always associated, plant agriculture, always associated with women. So it's probably true in the Americas as it was in the Middle East, as it was in Europe. Hmm. That may really be the explanation. It, but that's, you know, that's not even a very good theory. It's, uh, yeah. it, it's yeah. just kind of out there. It's just kind of out there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> sometime around 500 AD, which is pretty close to where in Europe when the Roman Empire is falling apart, Hopewell culture just fades out, just disappears. Is it quickly, quickly fades? Uh, you know, that's an excellent question. I can't really say. Yeah, we, No yeah, one there's... can really say because it, it does not appear that the Hopewell actually lived at these ceremonial sites. Oh, wait, really quick. Speaking of these ceremonial sites... Yes. Um, something I meant to ask when yeah. you said, you know, the Hopewell developed in the center of like surrounded by the Adena, correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. Were all of these burial sites, were these sort of like communal as far as different tribes all used the well, same ones or were they separate to each when, tribe? When you're using the word tribe, we just can't use that word with... Um, we cannot use that word with the Hopewell or with the Adena. We talk about cultures. Mm. How, how many tribes existed, if there were tribes at all? No one really knows, because what is true of both of those groups is what I told you earlier. They actually live in fairly small bands. Yeah. And uh, those bands seem to be lineage groups. So it's mm. probably just we're just talking about four or five families who are living in maybe four or five uh, very modest shelters. And that makes up the whole culture? Yeah, that's that's the whole culture. Mm -hmm. And and that's one of the things that really blows people's minds about the uh, about the Hopewell, especially. You've got these incredible sacred areas. Yeah. But you don't have any cities. It, it, it goes against everything we know about civilization. That usually you have these great monuments appear <clears throat> once you have urbanization, but you never have urbanization there. You never even have large villages. And, and it's very, very hard to explain. Now, it's probably true among the Hopewell that there were certain um, differences in social status, but the differences don't seem to have been great. Yeah. So well, especially if it's such a small group. Well, small groups. I'm yeah. going to use the yeah. plural, small. small groups. Yeah. There's actually quite a few of them. They're just spread over a large area. Yeah. And uh, the the big question is, well, how do they interact? Who organizes these mm. uh, these particular gatherings? And and there's no there's no really good explanation mm -hmm. to it. Uh, there is another slide that I would like to, I would like to bring up, and it is of a, a shaman inside of one of these uh, ceremonial buildings, and it's from, uh, you know, it's from that Facebook page that I had you all look up. It's kind of pretty dramatic. Oh yeah, it's. it's yeah, I don't think it's in that group. But we can find it pretty quickly. I don't know why it keeps going to that. Yeah, it's not showing up. Okay, slow down just a little bit, please. Uh, keep going. 
There we go. I see him now. Do you see the shaman? He's kind of standing up. And there, there we go, yeah. right there. In in the case of the Hopewell, this is this is a, if you will, a funeral ceremony uh, being depicted. So first, there is constructed this building, which is primarily made of saplings covered with either bark or skins. And then you see the two gentlemen that are kind of kneeling down. Hmm. What they're doing is they're cremating a body. Oh. So cremation was among the Hopewell, uh, something that occurred with significant frequency and the body is being cremated. There are probably bones left behind, which they would, they would place in a specific manner. And there are often things then, you know, once the fire is out, they would sometimes place, as I mentioned, red ochre, just like the, the Adena civiliz people in the Adena civilization did. But, but then they're adding to that, you know, some of these ceremonial pipes. And they're going to break off a piece of the pipe uh, so that this dead object, you know, once it's broken, it's dead. This dead object is then going to accompany the dead individual, I suppose, to the afterlife. And uh, sometimes they will add freshwater pearls. Sometimes they will add pottery with uh, a piece broken out or sometimes weapons, flint or obsidian knives, things of that nature. And then that will be covered over. And uh, perhaps two or three of these burials will occur within the same building. And each time there will be a mound of dirt placed over the burial site and then eventually the building will either be burned or it'll be deconstructed it'll be taken down and the whole site will then be covered over so uh, these mounds among the hope well just as among the adena will grow up over a long period of time some of them will become quite large and contain numerous burials and of course the difference is that the the Hopewell create these earthworks, these walls that kind of encompass uh, these sacred areas where these burial ceremonials will occur. And there'll probably be other ceremonials, other ceremonies occurring. Uh, not very far from these Hopewell sites is, is probably my favorite site. Uh, it's very close to Serpent Mound, which is of a different culture, but it's called Fort Hill. And very, very few people will go there because Fort Hill is um, very difficult to get to. Yeah. You literally have to climb up a, a, a very large hill. For Ohio, it's a very large hill. And when you get to the top, there is this enormous wall that is encompassing the entire top. And so... Mm -hmm. When Euro-Americans first saw it, they thought, well, these people must have built this for defense. They were afraid of somebody. But there are, there are something like 26 different openings in order to go through the wall into this very flat area, this plateau at the top of this very large hill. And for defense, that just doesn't make any sense. You know, you don't, yeah, you don't no, have that many openings. Sort of ceremony. So it appears that Hopewell people were gathering at that place, at Fort Hill, at specific times for particular reasons. Mm. And those reasons are probably, well, there you go, there's a picture of it. Those reasons are probably uh, dealing with religion. Yeah. Uh, but exactly why they're doing it at the top of this hill, I mean, it must have been excruciating to haul wood up there and other things to make the large fires they were making. Uh and, and to build the walls themselves, to haul the rocks up, because there's rocks under the under the earth of the fort wall that's that's hmm. surrounding this very very large area, and it's just baffling to people, and and no one to this day can really explain what they were doing, but it clearly has to do with uh, something ceremonial that they were engaging in. Uh, there's a couple of different explanations as to why the Hopewell culture faded out. Uh, 
one explanation is that the trade routes changed and uh, the demand for their products disappeared. They were not able to access the seashells from the Gulf, Co Gulf Coast that they were probably using as some sort of monetary exchange. Mm. And so the culture began to decline. Uh, a second explanation is that uh, it's possible that at some point, since they were creating these great earthworks with Stone Age tools, someone said, gee, I just don't want to do this anymore. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's that one generation of slackers that comes along yeah. and they say, hey, this isn't worth my time. <laughs> Why the hell are we doing this? Yeah. And a third explanation is that perhaps a new people came into the area, a new group of Native Americans who uh, who displaced uh, this earlier group, or perhaps they they kind of merged over time, which often happens with invasions, but the new group was dominant. They just didn't want to do it anymore. So there's actually um, what we refer to as an intrusive culture that appears sometime after 500 AD. They're called the coal culture. C O L E, and uh, I, I call I, I'd like to call them the slacker culture because rather than build their own burial mounds, what they do is they just stick the dead bodies in the burial mounds of the Adena, in the burial mounds of the Hopewell that are already there. And uh, for a while, that really screwed up uh, archaeologists because hmm. they they were trying to figure out what the hell's going on here because the dates were so different within these different mounds and it's because this coal culture was kind of an intrusive culture but so they were just reusing what was already there they were using what was already there yeah and their lifestyle uh, as far as the buildings they lived in uh living in these small lineage groups uh you know using that kind of uh small amount of agriculture to supplement the gathering they were doing, the hunting they were doing. It was probably very similar to lifestyle, apart from the uh, funerary, uh, or I should say the mortuary uh, practices of the Hopewell and the Adena. Uh, that's probably the only big difference. But <clears throat> sometime around 900 AD, two new mound building cultures are going to appear. One in the Ohio River Valley called the Fort Ancient Culture, and the other in the Mississippi River Valley called the Mississippian culture. And both of those cultures are truly spectacular. Uh, and I sincerely believe that they, they influenced one another. The Mississippian culture and the Fort Ancient culture are both going to peak in between 1200 AD and 1400 AD. And then they're both going to begin to decline pretty markedly after that. Yeah. Uh, although remnants of those cultures are still going to be around in the historic period, uh, when the first Europeans began to penetrate into the area. So uh, the Natchez Indians who lived in what now is uh, southern Mississippi and Louisiana, the Natchez were still practicing the lifestyle of the Mississippian culture as late as 1702 when the French began to create colonies in southern Louisiana. French pretty much wiped them out. And then the Fort Ancient people are believed to be the direct ancestors of the Shawnee and the other Algonquin speaking Native Americans that lived in the mm -hmm. Ohio River Valley uh, when Anglo Americans first began to penetrate into the area. So, um, you know, those cultures uh, continue to exist for a very, very long period of time. And like I say, they are, uh, they are pretty spectacular. Now, what they're going to kind of add to the mix is uh, their villages are going to be a little bit larger. And not only are their villages going to be a little bit larger, but they're practicing, both cultures are practicing uh, much more sophisticated agriculture. So in addition to cultivating things like you know, may grass and wild barley and, and, and sump weed and, and uh, sunflowers. They're adding to this uh, a lot of maize, what we would call corn. They're growing peas. Uh, they're growing a lot of squash. And um, corn, beans, and squash, and sunflower make up a big part of their diet. 
In fact, if you look at the four ancient people, the agriculture of their women was probably producing about 60% of their diet. And wow. I think that would also be true of the Mississippians. So, so really quick question about these, yes, uh, the Fort Ancients and the Mississippis, or Mississippians. Yeah. Um, did that, were they also into worship of the moon? They were not. Oh, In fact, okay. I was going to get into that. Oh, uh, okay. They are definitely, they are definitely into the worship of the sun. But they're the women still pro predominantly was. I'm sorry. The people provided the women still provided the predominant amount of the food and stuff like they, that. Yeah, they did produce. They produced an awful lot of the food. There's no doubt about that. Um, I do believe, though it's you know still up in the air. I do believe the Mississippians influenced the four ancient people, uh, mm. or the civilization of the four ancient people because they have a lot of similarities. The biggest difference between the two is the Mississippians actually had some pretty good sized cities. So the most famous of the Mississippian cities is on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River, almost directly across from St. Louis. It was called Cahokia. And at its peak, and it, it peaked pretty much from Oh, 1100 AD until about 1300 AD, there were about 20,000 people uh, mm. at Cahokia, which would have made it at that time about the size of London, England. Wow. So pretty significant oh, wow. size. Uh, the Mississippians had a highly stratified culture. And uh, this is what I wanted to get to with your question, Brian. Uh, they re Archaeologists, for some unknown reason, refer to the leader of Cahokia as the governor. And, and he had kind of a unique palace there in Cahokia. But it was believed by the Mississippians that whoever their leader was within their city-state, that he was the brother of the sun. That hmm. he was the brother of the sun. And so at these large Mississippian settlements and at the Fort Ancient settlements, you find what are called wood henges. The name comes from Stonehenge, only the yeah. calendars, the circular calendars, they always had 12 poles in a circle that would cast shadows, uh, that would create shadows that would go into the doorways of specific buildings in their villages. Oh, wow. At the solstice, at the equinox you know, at specific periods of time. So one of these wood hinges was, was discovered at Cahokia uh, in where Dayton, Ohio is today. There's the recreation of a Fort Ancient village called Sunwatch Village, and, and they have reconstructed uh, the wood henge there, and several other wood henges have been uh, discovered at these Mississippian hmm. and Fort Ancient sites. I have to say with the Mississippians, they had cities over a very, very large area, much larger area than the Fort Ancient people. Um, they were probably very much like the Greeks, had city-states, wow. common culture, but had city-states. Um, if you look at the, the photograph behind me, the Mississippians built temple mounds. So, yeah, they did build some burial mounds or buried people sometimes in their temple mounds, but the principal reason they're building mounds, that was to create platforms for cathedrals, for churches, if you will. Yeah. And they had a very stratified society. There was an upper class of royalty. And if you were the leader of a Mississippian village, as I say, you, you are related to the sun who is your principal God. You yeah. have tremendous power. Then beneath the, the governor or whatever you want to call him, beneath their leader and his family, you've got this kind of subclass of war leaders, uh, businessmen, uh, craftsmen, things like that, uh, priests. And then the vast majority of people were known as stinkards. 
and uh, some of them are slaves, some of them are free people. What do they do? They they till the ground, uh, they hunt, they make offerings. Uh, the Mississippian villages are laid out in grids that are directed by the cardinal points. Um, they have That's stockades around them. Within the stockades, there are neighborhoods. So lineage groups actually live in specific neighborhoods hmm. within a city like Cahokia. And then there are uh, suburban communities surrounding this central city. And they're producing vast amounts of corn. Um, uh, everyone pays tribute uh, to the leader. Yeah. And when he dies, he takes his uh, he takes his retainers with him. He takes his servants with him. So they are strangled and during his funeral. His wives are strangled during his funeral. So in Cahokia, there have there have been several uh, burials that have been discovered. Uh, clearly, one is a man of very, very high rank. There's six lesser people who are buried with him, probably his servants. And then nearby, there's a grave of 30 young women. Oh, who my are probably goodness. Something, probably his wives. Yeah. Who are, these young women were either sacrificed or... Uh, What's the word? Garroted? Is that what you call it when you garrote, kind of yeah. come up? And, I'm sorry? Like a garrote, I think is a how garrote. you say it. Yeah. They, would, they would choke these women during the funeral procession so that they oh could accompany goodness. their husbands uh, to the next life. Don't you dare do that with my daughter. Anyway, <laughs> uh, got to spare Haley there. Someone's got to take care of Luca. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this, this sort of society continued to exist uh among the Natchez Indians right down to 1700. Though, you know, the, the, the size, the cultural area by that time of the Mississippians had shrunk dramatically. So, you know, you could find uh, Mississippian settlements as far north as uh, Wisconsin. You yeah, could find wow. them as far south as southern Louisiana, as far west as uh, Oklahoma, as far east as Georgia. In fact, the mound behind me, Akmogi Mound, is in Macon, Georgia. Uh, mm. Wonderful site there. There's also a great site called the Etowa Mounds. Uh, the Etowa Mounds are just a little bit north of Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, you know, I'm always awestruck when I visit the Etowa, Etowa, Ottawa, Etowa Mounds. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little tongue tied because I've been talking too much. Um, <laughs> But closer to this home, awesome, you know, we've though. got the Fort Ancient people, and they're known for their absolutely wonderful effigy mounds. And the most famous of those, of course, was, was Serpent Mound. Mm. And I think you probably have a photo of Serpent Mound uh, that you can show us. Oh, yeah. I've also got it behind me. Yeah, there's a good depiction of Serpent Mound. Uh if you visit Serpent Mound, and I, I hope you take the time to actually do that sometime, uh, there are a couple of really remarkable things about Serpent Mound. The curves in certain, in, at Serpent Mound uh, do correspond to important times with regard to the sun. Uh, the, the autumn equinox, the spring equinox, and most importantly, the head of the serpent, or the mouth as it opens up, uh, seems to be swallowing something round, but as the sun sets during the summer solstice, uh, it sinks directly in line uh, with that oval hmm. that the serpent appears to be eating. So it's almost like this serpent was created to eat the sun, <laughs> during the as, or at least yeah. to mark the setting of the sun during the summer solstice. And several hundred people will usually go up to Serpent Mound every year uh, to witness that phenomenon uh, without fail. So the fact that the Fort Ancient culture, like the Mississippian culture, during the same period of time, had the wood hinges that, that kind of mark the movements of the sun, 
and the fact that this great effigy mound created by the Ford ancient people sometime around 1100, between 1100, 1200 AD, uh, that its mouth would correspond to the setting of the sun on the summer solstice uh, seems to indicate that these individuals not only had a uh, good knowledge of astro astronomy, but they also uh, really were into the sun. Mm. And since they were such agricultural people, I think having a good solar calendar to mark time is going to allow them to know the best time to plant, the best yeah. time to harvest. Uh, you know, a lot of people who garden, even in our area, they'll always pick up the farmer's almanac uh, mm. in order to be sure that they plant at the right time, harvest at the right time. I, I think this is the way that the Fort Ancient people were kind of trying to do that. Um, they lived in palisaded villages, not as large as the Mississippian towns, but the Fort Ancient people did live in palisaded villages. Unlike the Mississippians, they seem to have been very egalitarian. So you did not inherit your position as leader, as you would have in Mississippian society, but rather you got it through achievement and mm -hmm. you didn't hold it for the rest of your life. You know, at some point, somebody would replace you, probably because you were getting a little older and you would kind of, uh, I guess, retire to be an elder statesman. So, Did they have elections or something similar to that? Or was it just sorry? like kind of, did they have like any form of elections or anything like that? Or was it just simply the people putting forth this person? You know, the villages thing? were pretty small. Yeah. Almost everybody would have been related. I think just, um, God, this is, uh, I'm not comparing human beings to dogs, but you know, if you put a pack of dogs together, there'll be a dominant dog that emerges. They'll choose. They'll choose one. Yeah. And I, I think this is, I don't think there were formal elections. I think it's just who people are willing to listen to because they believe yeah. that individual has ability. Mm. And uh, uh, again, we're talking about a culture here, not a specific tribe. Uh, we're talking about a group of people who kind of do things the same way. I don't know that they, beyond the village level, had any very sophisticated uh, government that would rule multiple mm. villages or things of that nature. Uh, I think they were pretty happy with the way things were. And yeah. uh, it's kind of funny, for years in, in studying civilization, I think historians had a prejudice that all great civilizations had to emerge because there was a structured government and a strong leader who would collect taxes and tell people what to do. But I think we're finding now with, with some of the uh, archaeological excavations that are being done in the Ukraine and certainly with what we know about for an ancient culture that uh, you can have a great civilization with egalitarian, with egalitarian, <coughs> I'm sorry, with a great deal of equality with your yeah. civilization, that you don't necessarily have to have uh, a great deal of stratification. Hmm. Yeah, there's probably always going to be some people who have a little bit more. But if we look at the descendants of these people who were in Fort Ancient Culture, when we look at the Shawnee, when we look at the Delaware, when we look at the Miami, they actually respected people, not who uh, uh, just accumulated wealth to be able to accumulate wealth, but who shared wealth with other people in their village who were less fortunate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, prestige and leadership had to do with caring for your community as opposed yeah. to uh, trying to get a lot for yourself. Now, mm -hmm. it probably wasn't true in Mississippian society, but I think it was definitely true in uh, Fort Ancient culture. And of course, and the Fort Ancients were here or in the Ohio Valley. The Fort Ancients were in Kentucky, in eastern Kentucky. and central Kentucky. They were in southern Ohio. They were in a lot of the same areas where the Hopewell were, uh, and and also extend a little bit further south. Um, well, even though there's that large gap in time, do you think that there was any overlap, um, anything like that between their cultures or societies? I don't. As far as ideas or anything like that? No. No, the, the gap in time is too great. Yeah. Um, 
when you're looking at four to five hundred years, mm. uh, I would have to say uh, no. I don't. I don't really yeah. think so. Now the the big debate has to do with whether or not Native Americans from Mexico migrated into southern Louisiana uh, and then spread their culture northward along the Mississippi River. And, and that debate has not actually been settled. There's, there's one group of archaeologists who will say, well, there is no there's no definitive evidence to prove that the Mississippians, that their culture came out of uh, Mexico. Yeah. And that's true. On the other hand, <laughs> you know, you can look at some cultural traits. I mean, you can look at the Mayans, you can look mm -hmm. at the Taltecs, you can look at several other Native American groups in Mexico, and what do they do? They build temple mounds. Well, you know, you just don't see many temple mounds. The Hopewell had one seep mound very, very late in, in, in their history. <clears throat> but you don't see a lot of elaborate temple mounds un until the Mississippian culture arrives. And then the large-scale cultivation of corn. Well, you know, where do you see that? You see that in Mexico. Then yeah. suddenly in the Mississippian culture, in the Fort Ancient culture, you've got this large-scale cultivation of corn, beans, and squash just like you have in Mexico. And then the artwork uh, is pretty remarkable. And uh, I'm going to need your help to do this a little bit because I have, if I can get back to, uh, if I can get back to the picture of me, I put up as a background to be able to use as a background, my gallery. I don't need this. Oh. I need, uh, I need my see. gallery. I have to be able to access that. And I'm not exactly sure how to get back to that. At the bottom of your screen, you'll yeah. see a microphone, a camera. I do. And then, so if you just hover over the camera. Yes. You can choose background effect. Yeah. I just saw that a minute and I, a minute ago and I yeah. lost it. Okay. I'm going to try to choose another background here. And I want you to take a look at this artwork and see what you'd think. These are some very famous statues that were taken at a Mississippian site, uh, Etowah Mounds, that I referenced before. I mean, look at that statuary. It yeah, doesn't resemble anything that you see in Hopewell culture. It doesn't resemble anything that I see in any other sort of Native American culture outside of Mexico. I'm not seeing it. Uh, in Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma, you got the same thing. You've got this kind of, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but it's kind of like a devil-like uh, figurine. And uh, boy, it, it has all the earmarks of the statuary that you see in central Mexico. So when you look at the art motifs, when you look at the stratification of their society, when you look at the fact that they live in towns about the size of Mayan towns and that they're building temple mounds, not of rock, but they're building them of earth, then, you know, you got to kind of wonder if there wasn't some sort of contact between these people and the Native mm. Americans of Mexico. And, yeah, and you know, it's not that hard to traverse the, the Gulf of Mexico for this to happen or for someone to go along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, going from Mexico along the coast of Texas until you arrive at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So I, I really believe that there was some sort of cultural influence there coming up from Mexico, though that cannot be proven because of the lack of writing. Yeah. So did either of these cultures, the Fort Ancients or the Mississippians, did they have a, a writing, an alphabet? Not that I'm aware of. Like that? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Hmm. If they did, it's been lost. Yeah. Uh, certainly the cultures in Mexico had pictoglyphs, uh, you know, that were essentially writing. Yeah. But I'm not aware of any of those being discovered in uh, the Mississippi River Valley or in the Ohio River Valley. Now, there can be a reason for that, and the reason could be quite simple. Uh, the building material that was used mm. uh, would have rotted. 
craft. So yeah. if this was etched on wood or if this was on some type of uh, bark paper, it probably rotted over time and, and wouldn't be available. But there's there's no evidence that they had any type of writing. Hmm. That's very interesting. Well, do you or Nick have any questions? I've kind of blabbed here for quite a while. The, uh, this has been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what was the What was the one that you said? Also, I think your camera. I think you accidentally turned your camera I did. off. I'll get it back on there. Okay. Uh, go um, ahead. What was the? Uh, oh gosh, you said it was. It looked like it was a spiral in the Mexican culture. Looked like a devil. Oh, it's spiral mounds. Spiral uh, mounds. Look that up. Yeah, Nick. that's a that's a this. location in eastern Oklahoma. Uh, I don't actually. Yeah, there it is. I was there a few years ago, and uh, of course, much of that has unfortunately been destroyed by uh, artifact hunters. Mm. But in the museum at Spyro, the the original statuary of this uh, devil like creature uh, unfortunately was was sold off it's probably somewhere in europe now but uh a reproduction of it was in the museum at spyro and uh you know it's it's it's, it's one of those things when you see it as a, a statuary it it kind of takes you aback for a moment um i don't know the formal name for it but i do remember seeing it in the museum and i'd i'd seen pictures of it years before uh, being a nerdy kid, I used to read all these books about mound builders and uh, yeah. different archaeological sites, and they would often have the, the statuary. Uh, let me see. That looks like it uh, in the second row. Oh, I there see. It is right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's quite striking. Yeah. And uh, somewhat hideous. So oh, That's uh, pretty cool, too, though. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, like I say, it it doesn't usually reflect the type of statuary that Up that you area. would see in most Native American sites. Mm. And uh, you know, there's a second one that you all, you guys have projected up here in the right hand corner. Or I'm sorry, in the left hand corner. Yeah, right there. You know, you look at that, and and again, it seems. It seems more like something you would find in Mexico, yeah, than you would find at a a, a Native American site in North America, particularly uh, in this case in the in the prairie or plains area. So it, you know, it's really quite striking. And, so uh, this little guy here on the second row, he's got the hole in his head. Is he, is this also a pop? Yeah, it appears to be. Yeah, it appears hmm. to be. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Some of those, you know, I almost have to be there to see them in person up close. Some of them are actually vessels, you know, where you would put some sort of drink in. And so, oh, oh, that's okay. definitely a pipe. That's okay, definitely that's... a pipe. And some of them are pipes. That one's definitely a pipe. And some are like drinking vessels. Some are drinking vessels, right. Right. And w those would both be ceremonial yeah, probably. Used on their That's, temple it's, mounds. It's believed that it would be. And it's believed yeah. that it would have been. Uh, I yeah. don't think they smoke tobacco quite the way we do. You know, I think they kind of broke it out for special occasions. Yeah. And I know that um, even today among those who practice traditional Native American healing ceremonies, uh, the shaman will take in tobacco and he'll blow it at the, uh, at the person who is suffering. You know, well, that's actually to... really that's really interesting because tribes in like the Amazon and South America do the same thing with right. tobacco. Absolutely. That's that's really interesting that it's that's kind of like something that all Native American tribes do really no well, matter also, where they're from. You know, if we're to compare them to historic Native uh, American groups, uh, they also use tobacco for cleansing, which is kind of odd. But they would they would take bundles of tobacco and light it, and use the smoke in cleansing. Hmm. If there was something wrong with a structure or something wrong with a space, uh, a lot of Native American cultures, and we rarely deal with this, had a strong belief in witches. Yeah, had a strong belief in ghosts, 
and uh, and in spiritual entities. So in demonic-like entities, if you want to rid yourself or protect yourself from them, oftentimes they would a, a shaman would use bundles of tobacco and smoke from that tobacco mm. to kind of uh, rid the space of of such an entity. That's really interesting. Right, right. I think so. Hmm. Well, we've gone on for over an hour. Yeah. So Tom, thanks you for have being enough on, material. 